<laughs> okay, I'm starting the live stream. Okay, welcome everyone uh, to this next edition of VMAX. Uh, just a reminder, uh, your video will be turned off at all times, can't be turned on by you uh, or by any of us. Uh, your microphone will also be muted at all times, uh, except for potentially at the Q&A session at the end, uh, where if you raise your hand, we will give you the opportunity to unmute your mic, uh, but we will never unmute your mic without your prior consent. Uh, and so we will have that live Q&A for the 30 minutes at the end of the talk. So without further ado, let me introduce our moderator for today, uh, Laura Pilasov. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, so just before we get started, I wanted to remind everyone that um, for the month of July, we're turning the virtual macro seminar into a junior virtual, virtual macro seminar. And we sent out a call for organizers. So thank you all to, who, uh, to all of those who sent us an email saying that they would be willing to organize. And if you still are interested in doing that, please uh, go to our webpage and you can still sign up the form. Okay, so now let's get right to it. So we're happy to have Jonathan, Fabrizio, and Gianluca here presenting their paper on the rise of US earnings inequality, does the cycle drive the trend? So Fabrizio will be presenting and Jonathan and Gianluca are present uh, to answer your uh, clarifying questions in the Q&A. So take it away, Fabrizio. Okay, great. Thanks a lot uh, to the organizers for having us here. Um, it's a real honor. and. Uh, Thanks to all of you participating. Uh, I don't know, I don't see you, but uh, I miss you. It's it's a great to be online, but I'm looking forward to see you live. I miss you, all of you. So thanks again. So this is, uh, as Laura said, joint work with um, Jonathan and Gianluca. And um, uh, I'm gonna mostly talk about this paper, which has been something we've been working on a while, but um, like we're gonna have a bonus track at the end, hopefully get some time. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little, this, this, this paper is really about how recessions impact inequality. Now we, we, we are in these big recessions. And so we're gonna to try to look forward and see what we have to say about how this recession might impact inequality in the coming years. And this is with uh, also with Lucas Mann, who's a grad student at Princeton. Okay, um, so let, let me just start with motivation. Um, we, we know, we all know there's been a very large increase in inequality over the, in the US and many other countries, but we focus on the US over the past 50 years. And uh, most of the time, um, when we think about that, we think about secular co causes like globalization, skilled bicycle change, so long run trend that pushes the distribution, that makes distribution more unequal. Uh, we want to bring in more cyclical factors. When I think that recessions and the fact that we have business cycles actually might have impacted uh, together with this cycle term, I have a, a, an extra impact on inequality. Uh, so the question we want to ask is, as well, how much of the increase in inequality is due to the fact that we had the recession we had? Or differently, had we had less recession or milder recession, would US society be less unequal today than, uh, than, than it is? So this is, this is, this is the general point. And in the, at, at the end, the bottom track would be say, okay, now we see a big recession, very large increase in unemployment. What will it say for the trend in inequality over the past, over, over the next, uh, say, 10, five, 10 years? So I want to first show you some facts, which are going to be suggestive. So actually, the recessions uh, do play a role in inequality, uh, but alone cannot, are not enough to establish causality. And then I'm going to talk about a model, which is basically a very simple model of participation. Here, the whole story is going to be participation. Labor force participation is going to be the channel through which recession increases inequality. Then I'm going to show sort of some results and then talk about quality. OK, uh, our data is basically very, very, very basic. So we're going to look at CPS. We're going to focus mostly on the March CPS, so the annual survey, uh, which we have a, a, a lot of uh, a lot of um, a lot of data on earnings, so we can we can get pretty good uh, data on inequality. And we're going to focus on men, uh, prime age men, and, and men age 25, 54. I'll talk a little bit about why men and what we have, to, uh, what um, women a little bit, but in in a bit. So our measure is going to be earnings, which is wage and salary, 
business income and farm income before tax. Now there is also a very important issue is of uh, uh, what happened to after tax and uh, total income, government transfers, that, those are very important variables. So, but of course, the first, the prime determinant of inequality is earnings, so is, is, the, is the labor income that people make. We don't have capital income. Capital income is very underreported, so it's not gonna change this picture very much. It's very important at the top, but we don't have very good information at the top. So for, this is really not gonna be a, a theory of inequality at the very top, actually it's gonna be inequality at the bottom. So that's why we focus on earnings. Now, actually, an important thing uh, that we do is that we, we use inequality measures that include the zero. Now, a lot of studies in inequality uh, take care of the zero almost by construction. For example, the, the administrative data sets don't have, the, the don't have known earners. If you don't make money, you're not in, the, in there because you're usually, for example, based on social security, so they're lost by these people. A lot of people focus on uh, measures of inequality, like the variance of the log that exclude the zeros. But we think actually for, for, for a, in particular for looking at inequality at the bottom and thinking about participation, the zeros are very important. So the zeros are always gonna be in our sample. Okay, so this is the key figure. Uh, that's actually the figure that, is, that, that, that inspires to, to, to write this paper because we came across this, this figure with Jonathan and Gianluca, we wrote a paper on, like uh, an empirical paper on inequality for a special issue of red uh, 10 years ago. And so this picture was, was stopping here, but that's, this is the picture that we always thought we should go back to that because this is really seems to suggest that inequality and recessions are connected. So let me tell you what the picture is. It's basically here is, is all the, the data, the CPS data from 67 to 2018. And we have all basically different percentiles of the earnings distribution. So notice we started for the 20th because we have all the zeros in it. So in some periods, the 10th percentile is actually zero. In a bunch of people, you know, when the unemployment is very high, non-participant, the, the, the 10th percentile is zero. So that's why we focus on the 20th percentile. And we look at this, this, this number, uh, we normalize them to zero in, in 1967, and we follow it through. So basically this, for example, the P20, you see the stuff is going down, it's about now it's about 30%. It basically says the person which is at the bottom 20th percent of the, of the earning distribution, now the man uh, uh, age 25 before now makes about 30% less than he used to make uh, in 1967. So you can see that, um, you know, this, base, this picture basically tells the story that inequality is going up. So the bottom is going down, the middle is actually pretty much staying where it is, it's stagnating, and the top is going up by, uh, by 60, 50%. So obviously the, the finding out of distribution says there's been increasing inequality, fine. Now, the, 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 the thing that we wanna bring in is a, how about recession? Well, for example, let's focus now on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on this shaded area where there's a recession, and you see in recession, there's a big fall of the bottom, which now maybe, after in expansion tends to go back, but doesn't quite go back to the same. Now this cycle is a little bit better, but all the other cycles, big fall in recession, partial recovery, big fall recession. And here if recovery has been full, but it's, it took a very long, very long recession. So overall, statistically recession seems to be really at the heart of the increase in inequality in particular at the bottom. So just to make, to make the point a little, bit, a little bit clearer here, we took two measures of inequality. One is the 50-20, so that is the ratio of the median to the 20%. So this inequality at the bottom, so the difference between the, you know, the median and, 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 and the poorest share of, of the distribution. And you can see that this one, they're both going, the, and, and the other is the 90-50, is a ratio between the 90th, the, the top of the distribution and the median. So they're both going up, but the 90 is pretty straight, it's a pretty straight line. The 50, 20 tends to jump up in recession, comes back down a little bit, go up, back up in recession and so on. So that seems to be very, very connected to recessions. So uh, that th this fact suggests that, you know, maybe if we didn't have this recession, this line would not be as high as it is now. Maybe this, this, the, 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 the gap in society, the opening society between the mid, in particular between the middle and the bottom will not, will not be as high. So uh, 
that's that's what I just said. Now I'm I'm going to um, actually dig a little bit deeper before we go to the model in this gap between the in the middle and the and and the bottom, and and argue that the, the main reason why this gap open is not a change in wages, but it's really a change in participation. So I'm gonna. Uh, this is called the tail of the tail. So I'm gonna show that the, 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 the increasing inequality not only has very difficult cyclical properties, but also has very different um, drivers. So here we have three share of the income distribution. This is the top 85 to 95%. So I don't have the top 100% because that is affected a little bit by the change in top coding over time. So this is, this is just to avoid that. Uh, this is the bottom 20%, uh, uh, and this is the middle. Now, for example, let's focus on the, on the, on the ratio and the difference between the top and the middle. If you look, if you look at weeks worked, uh, that's constant. It's 50 weeks worked in 97, 50 weeks worked in 2008. So the top of distribution worth always full year. Uh, full year. Same for the middle of distribution, 50 and 50. So the, the, there's no change in weeks worked, so why there is an increase in earnings at the top and earnings are flat in the middle because wages reflect that. So the top of distribution is wages growing faster than the middle and that is reflected in earnings. So basically the top is all a story about wages, not a story about participation. But if you look at the bottom, it's kind of the opposite. If you actually look at the wages at the bottom, this is the bottom of the, of, of the distribution, the wages are, Fairly, you know, they go down a little bit. They're pretty cyclical, but basically they're pretty not that different from the wages of the middle. So, if you are working uh, at uh, at the bottom of distribution, you don't make very different wage than people in the middle. What happened? What, what changes is that people in the bottom do not work. The weeks work. The typical uh, the, the the bottom of distribution. Uh, the the men at the bottom of distribution. In, in 2018 works about 60% less than it used to work in 1967. So this fall at the bottom that, that we saw before, I mean, this, this thing here is mostly driven by participation. Uh, and even more zeroed in, if you look at, if you take the bottom 20% and you distinct, distinguish between people who actually work how many work, week they work, they actually people who work, they work pretty much the same number of week. And what, what drives the declining weeks is the fraction of work. So it's not that the people at the bottom work less weeks, no. It's a bunch of people at the, at the, people at the bottom who don't work. The prime age, remember the prime age men, age 25, 54, uh, they're not uh, institutionalized, they're, they're, they're like civilian, but they don't work. They do work way less now than they used, they used to work before. And that's why there is a fall in, uh, in, in the fall in, in the in, in earnings at the bottom distribution. That's why there's an increase in inequality that is that their income relative to, to the median. Uh, so sum up, this is our measure of inequality. The, the red line, uh, it goes up from about two to about Three, uh, almost three. It was uh, three point five. The top of the, uh, the recession now is about three. That's very much connected to non-employment of the men in our sample. So that we think that this is, to, if you want to understand why inequality rises and why it rises a lot in recession, you want to understand the participation. Um, now, what you might you might ask, uh, why do we focus on men? Um, I think. Uh, uh, the, the key thing is participation here. Um, participation is something which is affected by uh, many other factors for other groups. In particular, for women, this cultural factor. For older people, there is aging, aging population. So we think that uh, focusing on this prime age men allow us to focus more directly on the impact of recessions. But obviously not to say that these forces are not gonna be important for, for women, and so this is, this is a picture of um, the fraction of, of uh, employment for men, women, and households. Now we see for women, for example, let's focus on women, uh, there is a big uh, decline in non-participation. You have to look at the right scale early on. So obviously for women, the other factors driving uh, in a, a participation early on, but for over the past, over the past um, 20 years, 
if you compare the blue and the gray, participation of women, participation of men, obviously on different levels, but they seem to be also responsive to recession. So the forces we're gonna talk about, even though we wanna talk about men, probably apply to women as well. Uh, and the other thing that you might, you, might, you, might, you, might, you might think is, well, if you focus only on men, maybe you're gonna, maybe the one reason why men do not participate is because women are participating. And so if women participate and the men does not participate, then you see inequality at the, at the men level, but maybe at the household level, you don't see inequality. So that's not uh, too much to worry about. But in reality, that's not true. And so we actually, we, we look at, we have many pictures in which we look at the same picture for households and we get the same, exact same picture. So inequality at the household level is also increasing. So it's not just the men. And also this uh, other study, so this is this, this, this nice evidence, but if you look at, you know, if it was the case that uh, men who don't do not work, uh, they don't work because the, the spouse work, well, you should see that uh, this, um, the, the, the fraction of, of men with spouse that is in the labor force should be increasing, but instead it's not increasing. So this, this the people who do, who, who do not work are not people who don't work because their, their wife is working. So in, in some sense, it's a, it's a, it's a really an issue. Uh, the, the issue of participation recession is an issue that involves men, women, and households. So the men is just, it's just a choice because it allows to focus more directly on the impact of recession, but it's not, uh, it's not something that is only true for men and it's irrelevant for, for welfare purposes. Okay, so uh, what's going on? We, we show that basically uh, uh, we, 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 in recession, we have unemployment going up, the earnings of the bottom 20% going down, inequality is going up. Now, while we saw that this is true in recession, but it's also a trend. So, you know, these pictures are suggestive, but they're, they're not really conclusive. And so you could, could also be thinking about, well, look, inequality is really going up. These men are, are really, uh, there's some forces that push these men out, and, in, and recession only accelerates those trends. Uh, and the other interpretation is that, no, no, recession actually are the forces that, that drive up this thing and the sequence of recession makes this inequality trend. So the cycle drives the trend. So to distinguish between these two hypotheses, we're gonna build a model in which you have both a trend force and a recession force. And we're gonna to try to disentangle how important are these two se se force separately. And the model is really uh, a participation model. So we, we'll, we'll be more specific about it, but so the, the idea is we, we say kind of, uh, there's an interaction between these two forces. So it's not really that it's one versus the other, it's, it's these forces together that, 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 that work and, and create this, this, this trend in inequality. So basically uh, there is rec recessions, uh, is, uh, it's, it's, a war, it's a time which a bunch of workers uh, lose their job and, and when, when they lose their jobs, they also lose their skills and they lose their skills for a while. For a while. So we're gonna have discarding things. But now recessions do not randomly affect workers. They tend to affect low skilled workers more, which are already on the margin of participation. So basically you have a world in which you have some skill bias technological change that pushes the low skilled workers in worse position. A recession hits and recession hits more than low skilled workers who are already marginal push them out of the labor market. They lose more skills because they're out and so they might never go back. So there's the interaction between, uh, between recession and skill bias technological change. So both the trend and the cycle play a role and, we'll, and create what we say a double whammy for the low skilled workers which are pushed out and they decide to not to participate. And that itself is a very persistent state and that creates this long-term increase in inequality. Um, so let me, yeah, let me go to the model. I think I'm, uh, I'm doing okay with time. Um, so the model is, uh, uh, it's very simple. And again, the key decision is participation. So we're gonna have a three-state labor market. So every worker can be either employed, unemployed, or out of the labor force. And uh, the skill dynamics gonna depend on the state of the worker. And the key decision is gonna be the worker's gonna decide whether to participate or not. Once the worker participate, the um, employment and unemployment is sort of like an exogenous shock. Now we're gonna have these two forces that interact with each other. One is the cycle. And the cycle is gonna be, we're gonna this, we model it as um, suggested by Scheimer among others, uh, as increase changes in the, in the job finding rate. So recession are gonna be time 
in which it's very hard to find a job. Uh, and while the, the job losing rates is gonna be constant, although we'll, 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 that will deviate from the assumption in COVID because the data seems to suggest that it's different. And, um, but the job find, both the job finding and job losing rates are gonna be heterogeneous across skills. Particularly if you are the borrowing distribution, you have lower probability of finding a job and higher probability of losing a job, even though the, 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 the probability of losing a job would not change over the cycle. And the backdrop is also gonna be a skill bias technological change that's gonna make uh, the wages of the rich grow faster than the wages of the poor. So we first describe a model without this uh, cycle of trend and then we go to cycle of trend. So it's an overlapping generation model. So these people, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this generation lives for eight periods and they die and get replaced by another similar generation. So there is uh, uh, no population growth. So these guys are gonna have utility from consumption and leisure. And this is, this is uh, leisure here should be interpreted as everything which is uh, uh, that you get when you don't when you not work. Uh, so it could be also benefits, unemployment benefits. Um, the, every, every person this, uh, the, this, this is a dynamic participation. So people take into account future uh, consequence of the decision to participate or not. Uh, and in particular, they take into account that their skills might evolve through time uh, due to, to many factors. Uh, one, one part that we really simplify on uh, is that there's going to be no borrowing and saving. So your consumption is going to be equal to your wage if you work. If you work, you get your wage, you got to consume. Uh, if you don't work, your wage is zero, so but you get utility from, from leisure. That's why we have linear utility. So that's, this is, this is a, a, a big simplification. So we, we can't really say too much about the welfare impact of this increase in inequality. Uh, so all these workers, uh, they have a, a skill, uh, sigma, they multiply by the, the labor that gets produced output in the economy. Uh, so a little bit more, more specific on the, on the skills. So the, the wage is given by the skills times sigma. Sigma is the skill bias in technology. So higher sigma means that high skilled people are going to make more money. And so increasing in sigma is gonna generate an increase in inequality, but it's gonna generate an increase in inequality in wages. Our endogenous part is that wage is only part of the, of the earnings in, and there's another part of the earnings, which is gonna be the participation decision. And as we see in the data at the top, it's all wages. So the inequality at the top is gonna to help us pin us down the evolution of, of, this, of this thing. The inequality at the bottom is, is also depends on earnings and gonna be our endogenous part. So this is uh, for the models probably the, the most important slide in terms of description. So let me go through a little bit slowly, uh, and uh, but that's gonna tell tell the story. So you start the period with an aggregate state. The aggregate state tells whether you're in recession or in expansion, and we'll talk a little bit more about it as you know. And then you have individual states you carry on from the from a few period, which are your labor status, whether you are employed, unemployed, non-participant, and your skill. How, if you work, how much, what will be your wage? So at time T, you're gonna experience some skill dynamics. So this, you might have some shock to your skill uh, or some scarring. For example, if you are unemployed, your skills are gonna go down. Now, at this, uh, after you know the aggregate state, so are you in a recession? In particular, in recession tells you how easy it is to find a job should I decide to search for it. Uh, and what's my skill? I make my participation decision. And, and this is fully dynamic, so I'm looking forward. So I know, for example, if I'm staying out of the labor market, I'm gonna keep losing, uh, keep losing skills, and so I take into account. Uh, and so I make this decision and I can decide. If I don't participate, so I go down this branch, P equals zero, then uh, my, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be in the state of non-participating, I'm gonna enjoy full leisure, I'm gonna get zero consumption. If on the other hand, I decide to participate, uh, then I, I'm on the labor market. Uh, am I, am I, I, may be, I may be lucky or unlucky. So in particular, if yesterday I was employed, then I don't have to search. And if I'm lucky, I keep my job, I don't have to search, I get to consume. If I'm unlucky, I lose my job, 
And this one obviously depends, this probability is gonna depend on my, on, my, on my skill level. So I'm more likely to lose my job if I'm a low skill. If I'm unlucky, I lose, uh, I, I'm un unemployed. I get to enjoy my leisure because I don't have to search, I had a job and now I'm out and I don't consume. If on the other hand, I was yesterday, I wasn't working either because I was unemployed or was not in the labor force. Now this year, this period, if I wanna, I have to search. Uh, and so here, if I'm, if I'm lucky, I get a job, but getting a job is sort of a bad deal here because, well, it's not a bad deal, but you know, it, it's basically, you get, the, you get the consumption, but you search and, you, and at the same time, you also work. So it's, your leisure is really low. On the other hand, if you don't get a job, uh, you stay unemployed, you don't consume, but you have a little bit more leisure because even though you search, you have some, some leisure left. So that, those, are the, those are the kind of the, the timeline of, of a person in, in, in this world. And so the key decision is obviously this, and that interacts with what's going on in, uh, in, um, in, in the economy, in particular on the aggregate state. So let me tell you now all these different parts. Um, one, one important thing is the skill evolution. So this is the skill uh, at time t plus one. What is equal, there's a persistence in the skill. So if you have very high wage, you don't, you don't change completely the skill over time. So this, this parameter is gonna be fairly high. But then this is, this is an important part for our story is this, this carrying part. What it says, if you're employed, your skills gonna go up. So you're gonna think about learning by doing. And so you're gonna get more productive over time. If on the other hand, you are unemployed, your skills gonna go down. This is, this, is, this is a positive number two. So you're gonna lose skills over time. And so you're gonna, you know that if a long sp uh, spell of unemployment is gonna reduce your earning potential even later, even after you get a job. And then you have a standard skill shock. And this skill shock is what's gonna happen. It's gonna help us to create a, a funding, an increasing a dispersion in wages as people get older. Okay, so that's gonna be an important thing. Now that, the, the, the cycle, so we have studied this cycles minus, so how do we model cycles? So again, this is uh, very much uh, empirically driven. So we, just, we, 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 we basically wanted to have a simple model that could actually match pretty well the unemployment, the unemployment um, data. So we, 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 after playing around with quite a bit, we find that this is a, this is a pretty good compromise. So the aggregate state um, has, uh, four possible state, boom, expansion, recession, and crisis. And the key difference between states, if you are in, in, in a, the, the, they change the probability of finding a job. So basically the probability of going from uh, unemployment yesterday to employed today depends on the, on the aggregate state. And in particular in boom is higher, it's easier to find a job if you're unemployed uh, and, and in recession it's harder to find a job. While the probability of losing a job if you're employed does not depend on aggregate It's constant through time. And that's, we'll talk about the data, but it's, 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 it's supported by the data. But the, both probabilities depends on the skills. So low skill workers are, have a harder time finding a job and have, they, they are more likely to lose their job if they're employed. That's the cycle. We also have a trend, which is a standard thing. This sigma is gonna go up in particular, so the variance. So if you think about employment to employ people, different skills over time, their, the wage is gonna go, they're gonna be spreading out. And that's gonna be the, the, the trend in the background. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so we also have potentially some growth rate, uh, cohort growth rate. So the new generation gonna be more productive. Uh, but that's going to be neutral on participation because we also put a, an additional uh, an additional uh, value of leisure. So this guy, the, the participation choice of new cohort is going to be exactly uh, um, identical to old cohort. So we we we, I, we uh, maybe these things can be important for some cohort, but for, we abstract from this this uh, this this potential drivers of participation. So here the participation is going to be basically driven by um, your skill dynamics and your aggregate states and, 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 and the value of leisure relative to the average is gonna be constant. Uh, so what, what's going on, this is, this is sort of the, the intuition is that there's gonna be skill-based technological change is gonna create more wage inequality 
at the beginning of the labor market. And it's gonna lower also the opportunity for low skill, for low skill. This is all the skill by technology will change. I mean, it's important, it's fully anticipated. People expect that, they know what's gonna happen. So if I'm a low skill worker, I know I'm gonna have less incentive to participate because I have a less opportunity. So these low skill workers are gonna be more marginal. But now these, uh, these guys are gonna be more sensitive to a, skill sh to a recession when they lose their job and say, well, already marginal and I might, be, I might be out. And the important thing here, the key interaction, and I'm gonna go back to this, but I wanna start saying now, uh, if you don't have, this, this force is always true. There's always this force that's pushed the, the low skill workers toward making them more marginal. But if you don't have recessions, well, these guys work, and by working, they accumulate human capital, so they might be able to escape the, the risk of uh, non-participation and unemployment. And so they, at the end, they might not be, uh, the, some of them will actually, but not as, ma as many as if you have recession. When you have recession, you have these people that get thrown into the, out of the labor force, they don't work, and they lose skills, and that amplifies the, the, the fact that skill bias technological change. So um, let me uh, talk briefly about the, the, the key da data part that we, um, that we, we use to, to discipline the model. So one thing, one, one, one important thing is the scarring, is the fact that we have uh, um, uh, that when in recessions, uh, when, so not recession, well, there's two things. That is when people lose their job, and they go back to, to work, they, they, they don't get the same wage. And this effect seems to be my big, it's bigger in recessions. Now, of course, why is it bigger in recession? Because remember in recessions, it's harder time, it's harder to find a job. So you lose your job you, uh, in recession, you stay, you stay out of the labor, of the, or the labor force or, 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 or employment for longer, so you have a longer scarring, and that shows up in lower earnings, even upon reemployment. So there is uh, uh, David Simon Wachter done a lot of really good work in trying to, uh, to measure these things. And so those are the key, their picture. So this is, uh, they have, a, uh, uh, they measure the wages of people who lost the job and they compare it to a control group who did not lose their job. And this is the drop in recession. In recession, the, the wage goes up about 40, almost 40% on impact and then slowly recovers, but it is, even after 10 years, is about 50% below what it was uh, uh, the, before the, the employment loss. And in especially you have the same pattern, but not as big. So our model implies, I mean, we, call it, we, choose, we chose those parameters in the model so that we, think we, we, we have very similar picture. Now you might see that here we have a little bit of a bigger drop relative to the model. And that was a choice because here we have less of a drop. So we're trying to kind of get the same integral of this thing. But the key fact is that uh, recessions, in recession, you have a bigger loss of earning potential relative to, uh, to, to expansion. And then of course, the fact that it's bigger in recession is not constructed, it's endogenous due to the fact that in recession, it's, it's, it's harder to get a job. And so you have endogenous a longer spell of unemployment and endogenously a bigger loss of skills. Uh, so the other important thing is the transitions. So here, the, these are the transition between uh, employment and unemployment. So the probability of losing a job, and this is the normalized by skill level. So this transition we use, this use the standard thing. We look at CPS data, the monthly data. We connect the monthly with the March CPS so we can have earnings information. And so, and then we can, so we have construct earnings on the x-axis. We, we follow these workers. We take average over these years, and we we see uh, what is probability of, of losing a job or transiting basically from employment to unemployment. How this probability depends on the skill level. So this is the total average. Now, in the appendix, we also look at uh, um, we, this 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 uh, this plot for different periods of recession and expansions, and it's. It changes a little bit, but not by much. So taking, take, it, it's pretty constant across recession. That's kind of a Rob's point. Uh, so this is, this, is, this is the picture we decided to take. So easier to, to lose a job if you're low skills 
uh, uh, you're more, much more likely to keep your job with high skill, uh, but this doesn't change over time. It's, it's constant. What changes over time, on the other hand, is the, the other transition, the probability of, of finding a job. So here we have our four states. Uh, so crisis, it's a really hard time. It's really when this is crisis, this is where unemployment is very high. So we define crisis as periods in which unemployment is above eight or nine percent. Uh, and you can, and in, the, in during those periods, we, we feel that the, that the probability of finding a job is about 20% for the high skills and almost zero for the low skills. So those are very hard time. On the other hand, you go to the boom. The boom state is like when unemployment is below three or three and a half percent. And if you measure transition in the states, you get uh, uh, probability of finding a job over 40% for the high skill guys. Uh, and a little bit higher so for the for, for the uh, for, for those two guys. So booms are times in which it's very easy to find a job for everybody. So unemployment is gonna is low, it's gonna go down, and the other states are sort of in the middle. So these are the things that generate the, the, the recessions and, and booms and recession. And so how do we there's a bunch of other parameters in the model? So we at the end, our key objective is our calibration objective is to get a series for the unemployment rate and for the long-term unemployment that sort of look like the data. So this is unemployment rate uh, and this is long-term unemployment. So why long-term unemployment only? Well, because uh, our is we want to also get a persistence of this of the state. So we might it's fairly easy to get something that looks like that, but you might get, might get a much less persistent of unemployment. And so it's important for our decision, for the participation decision to have this labor market status that, that enough persistence. So that's why also we try to match the long-term unemployment and we're not perfect, but we, we, we do a decent job. So, uh, so this is how we calibrate, for example, the, all the different states, the job, line, the, the job finding probability, how they vary, uh, across states and the search costs and all, all these parameters trying to, to get up, up to this, uh, these pictures. Um, so the final thing we do is uh, we're trying to get inequality at the top. And this is uh, uh, a little bit, um, in a, we do it in a fairly mechanical way. So, and so we, don't, we don't claim we have a theory for the top, but given the functional format and the assumption about normality, the implication of inequality at the top reflects our input for the participation at the bottom. So here we basically have these uh, uh, two parameters. One is the dispersion of skill shocks. So how big are the skill shocks that hit everybody over time? And gamma S is how much the variance of the, uh, uh, of the skill, the, the, the inequality in skills increases over time. So what we do here, to do that, we, we, we look at um, age um, at time cells. So people are 20 in 19, uh, 1985 and so on. We look at, and for all these guys, we look at the 90-50 ratio. So the ratio in the wages. And then we, we, we try to measure both time effect. So how these things increase over time. So you take a 20 years, uh, 20 years old now versus 20 years old. Uh, 20 years ago, how much more dispersed is, is, their, is their, uh, their, their earnings? And that kind of pins down this increasing skill bias over time. And we also say, well, let's take a cohort and follow the cohort uh, over time. This is uh, as they get older, how, the, how their earnings are more dispersed. And that's going to be pins down the, dis the dispersion of skill shock. So we pin that down from, from this data at the top, where basically there's really no participation decision. So it help us pin them down. The, the pure wage thing. But obviously the wage also affect the bottom, but in the bottom, you also have participation. So it's gonna be an input in the participation decision of the bottom. So that's the whole model. And, and now we're gonna, uh, you know, uh, put all the input and do some experiment. So, and we're gonna do, we're gonna first do a baseline and the baseline is gonna be able to match the fact that talked at the beginning. It's gonna be able to match the fact that we have an increase in inequality at the bottom and that we have uh, uh, mostly driven by participation. Uh, but now we have a full model so we can shut down the different forces. We can say, what if we didn't have skill bias technology change if you only have recessions? Or what if you have no recession but only skill bias technology change and identify which, what, what drives the increase in inequality? Okay, so let me, 
first, let me start with non-participation because we know non-participation is, is, uh, is, the, is the key the fundamental force of this model and it's a fundamental force of inequality at the bottom. So on the left panel, I have uh, the data is the, is, the, is the black line and the green is what our model predicts. So it doesn't do a perfect job, but it's, uh, uh, you know, it, it catches the trend and it catches the fact that during big recession in particular, there is a large increase in, in non-participation and, and that never comes back. So this is a participate, this is a share of men with zero earnings. So this is basically tells that, I just wanna go back to the back of the number now. In 1970, about 3% of prime age men was not working. Right now it's about 12%. So it's a really, really big change. And that's our model captured that. And now here's a key result of, of the paper. So this green line, this is a baseline play by the model, how much is, is, driven, is driven by recession or cycle? So here, let's, let me start with, uh, um, with, the, red, with the red line. It's just a, a, an economy where we had only recessions. So there's no skill by technological change. So the, there's no increase in difference in the wage of the high skill versus the low skill. There's only recession, bunch of unemployed, people get unemployed and then unemployment slowly falls. And you can see that if we only had recession, still participation would have increased quite significantly, uh, non-participation from, from, from the beginning. So why is that? Why do you have that? Uh, it, even though you might think, well, a recession is, uh, is only a temporary thing, so unemployment goes back to zero, why do people stir up? The problem is that, you see, when you have a, rec you have a recession, you know, a bunch of people get pushed out. The low skill get pushed out. Even though here, low skills don't get worse, but you know, when the recession, they get pushed out. Pushed out because they're not the labor job, the labor force. Another recession comes, and so then they get pushed out again. So this continuous force, the fact that recession, uh, you guys, can, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, so uh, this was telling me that there was some problem with internet. Okay, perfect. So the the so the, the, the sequence of recession and that makes 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 hard for participation to go back. So it, it tries to go down, but then it's not a recession and goes back up. And you can see, for example, over the last cycle, uh, big recession pushed up a lot of people out, out of the labor force, a lot of people. And also what's important in a big recession or a model is a time in which unemployment is high and it's very hard to find a job. So a bunch of people are out of the labor force for a long time, they decide to not participate. And so non participation increases a lot. Now, having a long expansion brings it down, but only, only, uh, 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 only so much. So that, that, that's, 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 so then it says that even if you didn't have this trend, you would have had a, a, an increase in, in, in non-participation. Of course, not as big as in the data, but, but significant. If you only had uh, the trend, you always have, a, you all, of course, will have an increase in non-participation because the trend basically implies, so the skill bias technological change implies that low skill workers get pushed down to lower, lower wages. Uh, the, the, the value of leisure is, is not changing. Of course, they decide not to participate. But the thing about it, uh, if it was only the trend, it would be much less. And what's also interesting is that the actual increase in non-participation is bigger than the sum. There is an interaction between these two terms. And the interaction is that once you have a recession in the background, the trend is gonna make, it's gonna be more painful because you got these people who got thrown out of the, labor mar of the labor market because they lost their job. And on top of that, because of skill based technological change, their potential of earnings potential, if they go back, goes down. And so recession have a bigger effect and the trend has the bigger effect. So they, they reinforce each other complementary and they create an increase in, in non-participation, which is bigger than a single component. So <clears throat> we started with some question on how important are recessions, they're quite important. Definitely, they, they can explain about uh, one fourth, and maybe if you take in the interaction, even more of the increase in non participation that we see. Now, once you understand non participation, 
inequality sort of comes naturally because if you have a bunch of people that do not work, the earnings are zero. And of course, uh, the, so the, the earnings of the bottom of the bottom 20% is going to fall. So this is this is the 50-20 uh, uh, the ratio, so the increasing inequality. The black line is what happening in the data. Uh, the green line is what happened in the model. And you can see that um, uh, the, the, the model, again, matches, not perfectly, but matches uh, the data. W one thing which is interesting is that you know, one very rough characterization of this, uh, of, this, uh, of this inequality trend is that inequality goes up significantly when there is a big recession. So it is, this is a recession. And then uh, in the middle, doesn't, doesn't really move that much because you know, it goes up a little bit in, uh, during the small recession, but then the recovery, it, it tends to go down. And so there is, there is this, it's really, the thing that really seems to matter for kicking uh, increasing inequality seems to be the large, large recession. Why is that? Because the large recession is, 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 the, is the situation in which a lot of people get thrown out of the labor force. It's very, it takes a long time for them to, to find a job because the large recession is a crisis. It's a state in which the job finding probability is really low. And that's really pushing down their skills and, 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 the, and pushes people into non-participation. And so you, you can see here, uh, if you have only recession here, uh, yeah, you have a big increase and it fall, if, but it kind of recovers. Uh, if you only have the, the cycles, you have uh, a trend up, but the sum of the two is much bigger than, than, than the single. So for example, think about at the peak of the, of the great recession here, we have an inequality, which is much higher than these two. What's going on again is, 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 is the interaction between these two things is the fact that you have um, a bunch of people lose a job in, also on, on top of, of a very unequal wage distribution. So there's basically the skill bias technological change has pushed a lot of people very close to the, to the edge. Now the recession hits, all these people decide to go out and not participate. And that creates this big spike in inequality. So again, suggesting that the trend of course is important, but is maybe the more important thing, but I mean, you know, about uh, one third or maybe more of the story comes from recession. So recession are not just temporary factor that makes unemployment higher. Recessions are, are have a permanent but per, a very persistent impact on the shape of the earning distribution and participation. So those those are the kind of things. Uh, that, that's and you know they have this double whammy, so they seem to particularly hit uh, the recession skip about technological change, uh, particularly hit the, the, the lower part of the income distribution and pushing through non-participation. So um, let me just uh, spend the last 10 minutes uh, thinking about um, this, this current recession, the COVID shock. So <clears throat> I mean, the we're gonna use exactly the same model and we think it's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, it's a reasonable model to use because it's, um, uh, again, it's about participation. So when you wanna think about what's gonna to happen to inequality at the bottom, later it's not gonna be so much the unemployment, but all these people that lose their job, how long it's gonna take for them to go back to the labor market. Uh, <clears throat> so how do, we, um, how do we model? So we think, we think that the first thing to realize is that this recession is very different from the previous recession is that there's actually a very large increase in separation. So it's not like you know, people lose a job and don't find a job. No, people get thrown out of the job, all the restaurant business. So we're gonna have a, a, a very different uh, shock, which is not just a, a reduction in the job finding, is a big increase in job losing. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Now, there's another thing that, uh, other two things which are important about this recession. We don't know how long it's gonna last. That is, you know, the positive view is that it's just a pause and we, we all go back. The vaccine is gonna be happening in, in three months and we're fine, we go back to where we were. The negative view is that it might take a long time. It's a lot of uncertainty. Some of the jobs might never come back. And so we're gonna go to a standard recession as before. So these this jobs are out, but also on top of that, we're gonna have the standard stuff that we're gonna have a crisis state. It's gonna be a very hard, the job funding rate is going to be low for a while. 
The other thing that is, is different is that we have been very, very aggressive in granting benefits to unemployed people here. So uh, now, uh, you know, we, we all know that's been, uh, uh, if you're unemployed, you get this extra unemployment benefit, $600 a week, and we don't know exactly how we're gonna, we gonna, uh, how long we're gonna get them. So we also put in the model directly this additional unemployment benefit, which of course is gonna raise the value of non-participation. We model these things that say, even if you're unemployed, you got extra consumption. So that's, uh, and actually you also got, if you're a non-participant, uh, we put in the model, so we got this extra benefit. And so we say, okay, we have these two shocks to see what's gonna happen to inequality. So this is just uh, um, um, uh, the shock. Uh, so this is, this is just the first data. So this is just, uh, they came out a few, a few weeks ago. Uh, this is a data uh, for, for the, for the Mar uh, April CPS. So we got people in March. We can go link these people in March back to the March CPS of last year. So we know the earnings and we're gonna see for some of them how, how many of those lost their job. So this, the, the red line is for February before the recession and the blue line is for March. And you can see that uh, this is the job loss as, uh, as it changes with normalized skill level. So this picture is pretty much the picture we use for the whole period. So it's fairly, it's fairly low and about 5% for the, for the bottom of the skills at about 1% for the top. And you can see how this picture shifts up. It's, it's a multiplicated factor up. So at the top of, the, first of all, increases for everybody, even for the top of the distribution. So it's not just poor people lose the job, everybody lose the job, but for the, for the rich part of the distribution, it's about 5% increase in the job finding probability, job losing probability for the bottom is about 20% increase. So massive, increase in job loss probability on the bottom of the skill distribution. And now of course, these guys are gonna be the, the guys who are already marginal, not participating, now they get thrown out and they're gonna have a uh, harder, um, they're gonna lose their skills. And so they might be more likely to not participate. And so these are the unemployment scenarios. So this, this kind of reflects our assumption on uncertainty of what's gonna happen down the line. So we're gonna have three scenarios. Um, this one, uh, the baseline, uh, I call it Trump's dream because basically by November, we are back to 4% unemployment. So this basically saying, so basically this is what saying, we put a shock, we measure the shock we have in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in March. So we push us up unemployment about 15%. But after that, the job losing probability goes back to normal and the job finding probability stays in for the one at the, for the um, expansion stage. So in which is relatively easy to find a job. So you can see that there's a bunch of people get thrown out, but pretty quickly these guys get reabsorbed by the market because the, the economy has a very a relatively high job finding rate. Uh, the other one is a, a long crisis in which the job finding rate goes down as it did in the Great Recession. So this is sort of the same model of, of the Great Recession. So it's, it goes down and it stays down for about three years as it did for in the Great Recession. So you have this kind of jobless recovery. So very uh, unemployment keeps staying high and then eventually goes back down in 2025. And you have this sort of short crisis with just one year in which you stay in this crisis state, we means with this very elevated, very sorry, low job finding rate. And then slowly, a little faster than the crisis, the, the job finding rate goes back to, uh, to, 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 to the uh, expansion state. So those are then unemployment that we fit in, in, in into the model. And now we're gonna ask what's gonna happen to participation when people know that they're gonna have this, uh, uh, they're gonna have this, this pattern for unemployment and, the, and the, we keep everything else constant. So the scarring stays constant and uh, skill bias technological change stays constant. So this is a participation. Um, and uh, so we have four, four, four scenarios. So the, this is the baseline. And so basically the baseline says nothing happens. Even though unemployment goes up a lot, but because it's not persistent, people are not gonna change the participation decision. Some people are gonna lose their job but for, for not very long. So they keep doing it and, and they keep participating if they were participating, not participating if they're not, nothing happened to participation. 
But if you have, a, if you already have this uh, short crisis, if you have the the, the, the low um, fi job finding rate stays stays low for a year, you have participation. Uh, sorry, this is num number of do not participate. So the, the number are out of labor force of men goes to 14%. And if you have a long crisis and you extend extra benefits, you can have participation to go, uh, to go down, um, non-participation to go up above 20%. So you can have one fifth of prime age men to be out uh, of, of the labor force, which of course, it, it's, it's unprecedented. It's it's uh, it's 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 uncharted territory. Of course, it's a huge fiscal. You know, whatever you're doing, you may want to you may want to support these people. So it's going to say the fiscal burden is going to be really high. If you don't support them, it's all sort of the problems: consumption inequality. So this is this is uh, potentially a, a, a very a very costly and important uh, an important consequence of, of the recession. Um, interestingly. This is this is still work in progress, as, as you might imagine. But you know, we we uh, we look at benefits play play a big role. Uh, if you have a long crisis, but you don't have benefits, you pretty much have the same as having a short crisis with extra benefits. Of course, this is only participation. You know, here we have no sense of how costly it is. But you might want, if you have a long crisis, you might want to have the extra benefits to support this person. But you know, one cost of the extra benefit is that. Participation is going to be uh, non-participation of prime age men is going to be uh, very high. Um, so, of course, non-participation goes down. Sorry, non-participation goes up. Inequality is going to is going to go up as well. So, in particular, if uh, if again if in the baseline, no no much increase in non-participation, no much increase in inequality, uh, but in the long crisis, short crisis, you have fairly large increase in inequality. Now, you know, remember three was, you know, we, we were, we, we were about, about the, in the great recession, the peak of inequality. So the ratio between the media and the bottom was about four. And we were gonna go way above. Uh, and here I actually have to chop because obviously in the long crisis, the benefits, remember that you have more than 20% of, of men who not participate. Therefore, obviously, the 50-20 the goes to infinity, so this stuff actually is not even defined. But again, suggest that non-participation is going to respond a lot to the recession and increase inequality of society a lot. Um, it's interesting, uh, this is sort of more mechanical, there's no participation decision, but it's a consequence of the fact of, of uh, the separation shock. You also have a fairly, this is inequality at the top, the 90-50 ratio, both short crisis and long crisis imply a very large increase in the 1950 ratio, inequality at the top as well. This is due to the fact that you have the separation shock and the separation shock is, um, it hits more the bottom of distribution than the top. So you have these bottom people that at the bottom, they get thrown down in unemployment. Some of them, they participate, but even the one, and because these are all participants basically, but even the one who get back into the labor market, they get back with lower wages because of this uh, uh, scarring. And so there is this, there is this uh, impact also at the top, which is different like previous recessions because we didn't have this increase in, in, in separation, we didn't have a large impact on the top. So it was, the impact on the top was pretty constant throughout the cycle. This recession seems to have a, even a pretty big impact at the top. Okay, so uh, I think I'm, uh, I'm out of time. So uh, take away the, this COVID crisis is gonna pushing non-participation and equality at historically high levels. And so potentially it's, it, 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 it's something we should really think about it. Uh, what we wanna think about is think about women and non-prime age workers. For women, these things might, this recession might be even harder. Uh, when I think about uh, changes in the skill bias, um, which we don't know what's going to happen in the recession, but I think that actually because it's going to be, um, you know, people with high skills seems to be privileged, we can work from home. So that might be well, people have to change professions, so that maybe get to even bigger scale. Um, let me conclude. Uh, so we develop a simple theory of participation to explain the impact of recession and distribution. 
The key takeaway is that deep recession in particular can have a large and long lasting changes to the shape of the earning distribution. So they're not just temporary factors. They're like, uh, have they fundamentally shape the, the change the shape of society. We saw already that happening with the Great Recession. We're still keeping talking about that, about the Great Recession 10 years after this recession is gonna also uh, probably gonna have similar impact. And so something that we're gonna have to think uh, for the years to come. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. Okay, thank you, Fabrizio. So um, now we'll start the live Q and A portion of of the talk. So if you have a question, just use the raise your hand option at the bottom of your screen, and then I'll call on you to un unmute your mic. Um, hold on one moment. Let me gather up the questions. All right. So we have. Uh, Marco Passetto, I'm going to allow you to talk. Just unmute your mic. Uh, so um, the, the question I have uh, is about the counterfactual. Um, so you know, the t your title is the cycle drives the trend. So if I remove the cycle, I shouldn't be just removing recessions. I should just kind of squish recessions and uh, um, expansions together. I was wondering whether you've tried that and how much of a difference it is. Right now, it's just a, removing the bad state gives you something good. What if you kind of avoid the cycle by averaging? Um, Gianluca, do you want to take it or should I? I can say, I mean, uh, so, so I think oh, yeah. we have, you know, our process at the moment, we have four states. There's the boom. The expansion, the recession, and the crisis state. So when we remove the cycle, we uh, we, we assume the economy is always in the second of those, which is uh, so it's not the it's not the biggest boom state. It's just it's the uh, expansion state, which is uh, about a four percent unemployment rate. So um, yeah, I know. I mean, obviously, there's a question about what it means to 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 remove the cycle and, and what well, what the best way to do that is. That's just the way we did it. We could we could have uh, we could have taken the I guess the long run average unemployment rate across all the ergodic distribution and, and we could have plugged that in instead. But I don't think it would make a very big difference because I think that the long run ergodic one is pretty close to the to, to, to the to the expansion state. Okay, thank you. Uh, so next we have uh, Marco Del Negro. Hi, Marco. <laughs> Yes, hi. Um, great paper. Thank you very much. So uh, if I understand correctly the model, uh, one implication is that you get rid of unemployment benefits altogether, and that would really help uh, inequality because just people are forced to work if we get into a recession. Um, you know, do you take that literally? You know, what's your take? Um, so, uh, yes, uh, the model has um, uh, has this uh, value of leisure, and if you set the value of leisure to infinity to minus infinity, everybody will work. Um, um, the, the the question is, you know. I don't think we 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 can't really say too much about that about how desirable is this. Obviously, <laughs> we know it's not desirable because uh, you know if you still you might want to work, but if you don't find a job, you have zero consumption. You get, you, your utility is going to be to minus infinity. So I think to answer the optimal, um, you, know, you know, one way you can say is what will be the optimal. Um, a size of unemployment insurance in, in, in our model. And it's, I don't think this is, this is our best model to think about that because again, we have linear utility. Uh, so I, uh, my, my, our, 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 our issue, so for example, when you do this COVID thing, so we, we find that um, more generous unemployment benefits do increase non-participation, but we don't say this is uh, necessarily a bad thing. I mean, maybe a good thing because these people are lose a job anyway and want to support them. So our, our thing is it's really not about what's the optimal thing. It's really about the impact that uh, a particular uh, unemployment benefit in particular making 
the non-participation state and employment state more more attractive, what's how's going to affect participation? That's our thing. We, we can't really talk about optimality. Thank you. Just to, just just to add quickly to that, I mean, I think one thing that we were thinking about with COVID, and and it's a little bit unclear, but this expansion of benefits they have right now, so. You could model that as a benefit that you get only if you're actually unemployed, uh, or 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 you could model it as a benefit that you can get, you know, even if you're really sort of not participating, not looking for work right now. And I think at the moment the distinction between who's unemployed and who's not participating is is pretty fuzzy because, you know, there are a lot of people who are collecting benefits who are not actively searching for work, and they in sectors that they're not allowed to work even if they wanted to. So. So I think, you know, obviously, if you have a benefit that you can collect, um, even if you're not participating, those benefits are going to encourage non-participation. But a traditional unemployment benefit where you only get it if you're sort of actively searching for work, that, that would have presumably a, a smaller negative effect on, on participation. Yeah, so, so I think just to, I think to, to be clear, I think Fabrizio, the, the simulation that you showed are those where the unemployment benefits are paid to both the unemployed and the non-participants. So in the in the all the simulation uh, of the um, you know this last recession the the COVID uh, simulation that we show in the end we made the assumption that throughout the duration of the uh, of the crisis the unemployment benefits are paid essentially to whoever is out of work with the idea that you know the uh, there's not going to be a lot of enforcement uh, on the uh, on the job search uh, during this time precisely for the reason that the Jonathan um, uh, said earlier, but you know we could do like different scenarios. And one in particular could be where this is not very enforced very much at the very beginning, and then later uh, it is enforced. And and at that point you would see a decline in non-participation because you, you could see some you see um, people moving from non-participation into active search, uh, and therefore that change in enforcement would push people into participation into unemployment and possibly into work later. No, th th that's right. But during the, the Great Recession, for instance, right, where only unemployed people were paid unemployment insurance, you could have done you could have done the counterfactual of oh, what if we don't, you know, replacement rate is zero. Um, then I guess your model would say that a lot of the scarring effect would be lower because those people would have had no choice but to participate would that be correct and do you take that literally yeah for sure the the, the there will be less less increase less <clears throat> increasing on participation but we can't really say that that would have been a good thing that's that's uh but for no, sure no, most places, if you had that if you yeah if you had uh, basically the idea of we take the value of leisure and if you somehow can reduce it. In our model, we don't have a, we didn't have any increase in the value of leisure, but you know, we could have said, we didn't put explicitly uh, benefit job in, increase. And even though in the great recession, employment benefits were increased, uh, we didn't put them in directly. So, but we, we, one could have said, uh, could have like lowered it and see, and I think you're gonna get lower, uh, higher participation, but we can't really say it would have been optimal. Now we are model. Thank you. Thanks, Marco. Okay, so next we have Evie Papa. I'm gonna uh, unmute you, just unmute yourself. Uh, it is fortunate that I have to talk after Marco because my comment was uh, very similar. Hello, everybody. Uh, so uh, I also think like, okay, the, the, you have a first part of the paper, which is not related to COVID. And I think it's very clear cut, the conclusions and everything. I had my questions, I, I, they were answered. Uh, and then the second part, when you go to the policy analysis, it's, it's a little bit unfair. And why I say that? Well, because you see, you're thinking about unemployment benefits when, and give it like, it's like universal income, what you're assuming, okay? But then there are other active uh, labor market policies that the government can do to keep the guys from uh, uh, like reducing the scarring effect or something like that. Uh, so like uh, just saying that, uh, you know, we're not giving money, uh, if we give unemployment benefits, the recession is going to be double or triple, that it's a bit unfair. I didn't like it. 
um, yeah, is this one thing that that, that is uh, that is and, and is what we said before? It's not the, the recession. Actually, the unemployment is not going to change uh, dramatically. Uh, uh, change whether you give actually almost nothing, whether you give the, the benefits or not, because you give the benefits to non-participants. But the participation decision is going to change. That's our, our thing. Uh, I don't know. I, th I think maybe is is um, um, is a bit unfair, but the spirit of the exercise is saying, look, we're trying to estimate a little bit the, um, how participation changes over the cycle, trying to put these forces and the forces that what makes you participate is this opportunity of getting better wages, get a job. And, and, and the fact that if you don't, you're gonna lose skills. So we have that. And, uh, and, and what makes you not participate? Well, if you, if you don't participate, but you have set, you know, better benefits, you're gonna take into account. And now one thing that is changing this recession that we really increase the benefit of non-participation. Uh, so of course, you know, it's an elasticity question and we can't, uh, so I, I don't wanna, I don't want you to think about these numbers as the final numbers, uh, but we, we always suggesting that the machinery that seems to work okay in a, estimating the elasticity of participation margin so far, if you take literally put these things in there, that tells you that it's gonna have an, a, a fairly significant effect on participation, which again, like I was saying, Marco, I'm not saying this is, this is bad. That might be good. That might be what you wanna do. Uh, because that's one way you want to enforce resharing for these people who are at the bottom distribution. They might have problems uh, finding a job. So maybe efficient thing to do. I'm not. This is a whole different question. Uh, but in terms of uh, positive thing, our model suggests that that's the case. So that's that's how, what we got. I don't know. Uh, no, but what I mean is that there might be complementarities that you don't model here and you just give us a partial view of the world you know like the fact that you know i'm not going to participate might be optimal at the end you know because uh, because like you don't have repercussions in consumption demand etc you know you don't have these complementarities that you might uh, think that giving benefits to people and uh, these people keeping a, a, a demand high is something that i don't see in your model so you know it's like it's a bit unfair that's what i mean but, but I, I agree completely. Uh, let me say it again. Yes, I agree with you. And uh, w w what I'm saying, w it's not obvious that this is necessarily bad. And it might be fairly, uh, it might be fairly easy to write a model in which doing this is exactly what you want to do. All we're saying is that doing this might actually have uh, increasing, uh, might increase um, non-participation. Uh, and you might also say, well, maybe the, I don't even buy that, but I don't know. That, uh, oh, that's no, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. I don't want to push it more. No, can no, I no. add something? Can I add quickly something to uh, answer Avi's uh, question? Um, so I think that there, there is another uh, uh, dimension of the current crisis that is very peculiar, uh, say, with respect to, say, the Great Recession, uh, which is the, the fact that, at least for now, a lot of these workers are on temporary layoff. Uh, so if things go well, as we all hope, many of them will be rehired by the same firm, hopefully relatively quickly. And <clears throat> this is, a <clears throat> is an important uh, uh, element uh, in our logic, because remember that in our model, <clears throat> when you lose your job, you lose your skills. And you, lose, uh, and you keep losing skills as you are unemployed. And one of the uh, interpretation is that uh, of that, and, and, and you kind of see it from the uh, both in the data and in the model, uh, this sort of this big drop in um, uh, in earnings and impact is that you lose some uh, job specific or firm specific human capital, right? So right. if you get rehired by the same firm, then uh, that loss would be much lower. And if you if you if you do think that uh, there is a high chance you will be reemployed by the same firm, um, then uh, you know you you would you would keep participating uh, because you realize that your your skill loss is not as large. Um, and uh, 
one way of capturing that dimension in our model is relatively simple would be in the something we thought about we haven't had the time to do yet is in the current recession to cut the parameter that determines the uh, the skill loss uh, with the idea precisely that you know there will be a, like a fraction of workers that are rehired and so for those workers unemployment is a very different experience uh, from like being unemployed uh, after having permanently uh, lost your job and, and and therefore being rehired by a different firm so that's also uh, some scope for optimism in that dimension and that would reduce certainly the number of uh, non-participant and the rise in non-participation great thanks thanks to both thank you Abby. Laura, you were muted. Right, I can follow my own rules. Okay, Ben Schofer, if you could just unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, I have a question um, about the notion of labor supply in the model. There is this excellence of marginal uh, labor supply curve in the background, which of course is much richer, long-term job uh, search frictions and so forth. But ultimately you alluded to a lot of things being driven by the mass of these marginal agents. I wonder whether there's a diagnostic test or cross-check how realistically elastic that curve is. So say, could you run, to assess its realism, could you run, say, experiment, uh, empirical cause experiment in the data? What happens if UI benefits get extended as they do in the data? What does labor force participation move like in the model or say a tax holiday? I wonder whether it's kind of the implied elasticity match up with what we would see in the data. Thank you. So, so you want something, okay, so, I mean, the, the time series of, of non-participation uh, over the, the 50 years uh, match pretty closely with the, the ones in the data. So in that sense, right. we, we do think that the, uh, the aggregate time series elasticity uh, is the right one, okay? What you want is something extra. You want, you want to make sure- Like a short are, run. Yes, that's kind of the short run, the short run or the, uh, say, I don't know how to call it, like the, the very like short-term partial equilibrium elasticity, exactly. where you, right? Which, which you would compare say to a, like a diff in diff estimate, something like that. Yes, uh, because I guess what's competing in the background is some behavior that drives labor force participation that isn't along a labor supply curve. I'm not even sure how to articulate the question because ultimately it does sound like a labor supply choice. I just wonder whether the models implied elasticities match up with what we see in the data or perhaps whether the shocks might be larger then we would imply and so forth. Um, well, okay, yeah, no, this is, this is a great point. I think we can do more about this. I, I just say that, you know, the, the, I think the aggregate shocks are the right one in quote because they generate the right movements over the time series in unemployment and, and, and long run unemployment and long term unemployment, excuse me. Okay, so I don't think yeah. we're, I don't think we're feeding shocks that are too small or too large. And again, I think the aggregate uh, elasticity. Um, over the time series is correct for the reason I explained, but we can certainly do more. We could we could do like um, one of those. Uh, we could replicate, say, within the model, uh, 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 like a, an experiment, a well-designed experiment. Where um, I guess we could look at some of your papers, uh, <laughs> where the um, the change in, in UI benefits uh, generates a certain change in, in non-participation, and we can see if we are close to uh, replicating that particular. Yes. And perhaps among the low income agents, for example, I'm, I can't even articulate to some degree, but probably it's tautological uh, to like the model is a success. I wonder, yeah, whether, yeah. I, thank you. It's yeah, yeah, got it, got it. It's, it's a good point. We should do a bit more along that. Can I see my screen? I do. Oh, okay, so this is just a partial answer to your question, man. Is, you know, as, and you're absolutely right, it's, it is the marginal people who, who, who matter. So here we have, we plot, this is models plot, and we have the excess log wages. Uh, so zero is the one in the wage in which, you know, you, you have margin between participating and not, and not participating. And here we do exactly the, 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 the thing is before and after the, the, the Great Recession. Or I mean I don't know. We can you can see even uh, even uh, so this is 67 2017. So you basically see how the in increase in skill bias technological change has flattened the curve and so make this elasticity bigger. 
Because basically, think about a recession is moving around this way around zero. And if it happens in 1967, you have everybody is to the right of zero. So a recession doesn't really have a lot of change. Elasticity is very low because you have very few marginal people. But after 20 years of skill bias technological change, distribution has pushed many more people down here and you have a bigger elasticity. So maybe getting this yeah. kind of picture in the data can help us uh, uh, answer better your question. Thanks a lot. Fascinating, thank you. And just to say, I mean, Ben, I think that the, 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 the kind of the natural experiment that's that, that, that's going to be, I'm sure people are going to write many papers about it, is this current expansion of benefits, which, which is huge. It's huge. And there's $600 on top of whatever you were getting before. So if you're working 40 hours a week, $600 is, is an extra $15 an hour. So there's, I think, a nice, like, um, MBR paper came out the other day by um, Joe Barbara and Colton. Uh, no, no, Joe Barbara and Colton. Yeah. No, I don't think the Barbara one. I was thinking about the one with um, with Eric Hurst and, and uh, Courses, uh, Grigsby, Grigsby, and Grigsby Hurst and Courses. Yeah, so they, they were saying uh, that yeah, I think for 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 about two thirds of people who 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 are who are unemployed, the replacement rate is now over a hundred percent. So it, it, it is enormous. Uh, I, I think the median for the median uh, unemployed worker is about one hundred and thirty percent replacement rate. When you take the six hundred dollars on top of what people were getting before, and at the moment those six hundred dollars uh, that that extra benefit is supposed to run until the end of July. And so, you know, a huge policy question is gonna be, what are they gonna do with that? Are they gonna extend it? And for how long are they gonna taper it out or, or change that system? But at the moment, if that, if that, if that extra benefits, if they stay in place for a very long time, you know, it seems very natural that many, many low wage workers, if they have the chance, are gonna to prefer to remain unemployed. Well, let me refer, let me rephrase as follows: If in response to that massive policy, in your model the employment rate drops by fifty percent, I'm making this up, of course. Um, I, I wonder whether that would be whether that would be a counterfactual implications. Of course, I haven't seen the data. I haven't seen someone compare the Ganong, uh, Noel, and Wafra replacement rate increases with uh, unemployment increases and so forth. But I I wonder whether that would be. I completely agree with you. With, that there will be a suitable natural experiment. Thank you. Yeah, I think just to, to conclude this super interesting point, I think, you know, um, as the data come in, I think someone will, will try to help estimate this effect and we can use those estimates into the model to uh, fine tune the, the key parameters of the model. Let's do it, great. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. So now we have Andy Newmeyer. Can I just unmute yourself, please? Hi, it's uh, nice to see all of you. Um, I have a, a clarifying question on uh, the evolution of skills. You have this uh, OG model going for like 50 years or something. So what you do is a uh, long run effects of recessions, I want to understand what happens with the distribution of skills of uh, the new generations that come in, probably they have a more college, uh, more education and so on. That's uh, one question. And the other, it's not a question, it's like a suggestion. Um, I think that this recession, the COVID recession is very different from other recessions because it's like people, decide not to go to work for a while, and then presumably they will go back, which is a little what uh, Gianluca was saying. There might also be some reallocation. So in some way, when you do the experiment, you might want to try to think about when the data comes and differentiate between the rest unemployment or the temporary layoff and uh, the reallocation, because the two things are going to be very different in your model. That's it. Um, John, you're, you're not unmuted. Uh, apologies, apologies. Um, I, I'm going to answer uh, quickly, uh, and then if you guys want to um, add something, uh, go ahead. So, so there is in the model, uh, in the background, uh, um, rate of growth of average skills. Uh, so there's like, imagine that's kind of productivity growth, uh, 
um, uh, or you can interpret that also. Yeah, productivity grows also due to the fact that people, um, individuals uh, go more to school, accumulate more human capital and so on. So the new courts enter more productive than the old courts. Okay, so the but new- Do you have catch-up? Do you have like public school catch-up? Maybe the poor Excuse ones me? go to good. Maybe the distribution of skills is also changing over time because of public schooling or- well, the distribution of skills is changing over time. Idea. The distribution of skills is changing over time in the model for two reasons. One is the mean that is growing. The other one is the skill by aesthetical change. So it's the variance. The variance of skills is uh, is opening uh, up, opening up, uh, widening, um, which is this kind of long run, long run trend. The, we decided to to have the growth rate of productivity be the same as the growth rate of uh, uh, value of leisure. Uh, to, um, uh, to have some notion of balanced growth within the model. Uh, yeah, for example, example, did you look, I, I have no idea of the data, but it might be that uh, it's easier for poor, that the growth in educational achievement of uh, poor people is uh, bigger than for rich people. It might be not, I don't know, but. I think if anything is the opposite in the US, that's my, <laughs> that, would, that would be my, my guess. Uh, and I, I think in some, to some extent that's captured by skill by aesthetical change precisely. I mean, you can think of, uh, imagine, I don't know, I'm, I'm speculating a little bit, this is way beyond what's in the model, but, but suppose that the sort of the quality of, of education uh, for uh, the low skills because of the deterioration of the quality of public school relative to the, the rest of education is getting worse. Uh, then uh, this is, would be a force that is captured by skill by aesthetical change, essentially. Yeah. Uh, the, other, the other point you made is, is uh, I think is, um, uh, is super interesting. And I, I think uh, it would require basically, but it's something we can do. We just started working on this <clears throat> COVID part of the paper. It would require to add an additional individual state which distinguishes between like a permanent uh, separation and temporary layoff. Um, <clears throat> so the idea would be, you know, you, you lose your job. Some of these um, separations are temporary layoffs and with the potential of being rehired, others are not. And the ones that are being rehired, if rehired, you, you can make the assumption that there is no uh, uh, skill loss, okay? So they would, uh, uh, they would obviously um, reduce the rise in non-participation and, and both statically and dynamically because going forward, those workers have not lost skills during unemployment, and so are less likely to become non-participants in the future. I think, let me add quickly on this. I think it's exactly right. It's a great point, but this recession is very strange in this of this, because for some workers, say you, know, you work in a restaurant and your restaurant is closed for two months, you know you're gonna go back, and there's no loss of skill, it's just temporary, you go back, you wanna, there's a, no change in participation. But for some works, other workers might be much bigger than before because the sector might be gone. So you are a massage therapist and massage therapists are gone. So those guys, not only they lost their job, they lost the whole sector. They are, they're not gonna go back any job in, this, in, in, their, in, in their sector, so they're gonna re, have to reinvent completely. So it might actually get for some workers the delta, the scary might be even higher. So it's a yeah, mixture. Yeah, and exactly. and so, so maybe that's a, that's a, that's what makes a difference. So maybe we should. I think it's we don't not there yet, but I think our model has kind of a. It's kind of the the, the apparatus to think about that, and so maybe one thing we could do have a, an heterogeneous deltas for some person. Delta is actually very low, and for some person it's very high. And, 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 and then get this recession, analyze the recession in a film like that. But this, yeah, that's what I was saying of, that you could look at in some way the share of people that are affected by like a reallocation shock. Yeah. And the share of people that have like rest and employment. Yeah. And yeah. then uh, see maybe what's, how much employment will shrink in some industries that will be smaller for a while tourism, travel, I don't know. Exactly. Okay, so we're almost out of time. I think we have a couple of minutes left. Um, I know some of the panelists had questions. So if we have room for one more, maybe Stefano, you wanna go ahead? 
Okay, uh, I'll try to be quick. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the role um, of occupational and industry distribution in your analysis, because you're focusing on men who are primarily employed in the goods sector and in production occupations, which I think are less um, exposed to skill bias technological change when compared to service, uh, the service sector and service occupations. So, um, so then uh, thinking about uh, the pre-COVID recession versus the COVID recession. So the COVID recession has, at least in its initial phase, affected more service sector jobs um, and service type occupations. And so presumably then uh, some of the scarring effects and so on may be different for these occupations uh, because um, you know, the capital share is much lower for these sectors um, and there's a different impact of technology. And then that's the first point. The second point is the the relation um, between um, men and women. So you've pointed out that in the last 20 years, um, women tend to be more similar to men, but on the other hand, women are primarily employed in the service sector. Um, and so that points to another distinction, you know, sort of extrapolating from men to the entire economy and also extrapolating from the pre-COVID, you know, um, uh, analysis to the COVID recession. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that uh, with respect to these, to these two points. Jonathan, who wants to take it? It's um, hello. Yeah, I, I can take it if you. Uh, can you hear me, guys? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I think so. Okay, so I, I don't have a great answer. I think uh, uh, these are um, both good points. Uh, uh, I, um, you know, I, I think that um, uh, sort of extrapolating to, uh, from like men to women, there are, you know, many differences that the model uh, should take into account and we have not really thought too hard about it. Uh, certainly what you're saying is one of them. I mean, in terms of like the different, so you, you mentioned the different degrees of skill by technical change. Uh, that's something that the model can easily incorporate because um, uh, we would use precisely the same approach that we use for um, measuring in quotes skill by technical change in, in the model for men. And we might, you know, well end up with a, uh, like a stronger uh, a skill bias uh, when we, um, do the measurement exercise of women for the reason that you're saying. I think um, I don't remember off the top of my head numbers that uh, uh, show a big difference between the degree of skill bias between services and, uh, and um, manufacturing, but you obviously might be aware of those. Uh, I'm thinking services, there's a big mix, right? Because there are, I mean, clearly there are I mean, there are some services where, um, uh, like you think about, I don't know, like, you know, uh, food preparation, I don't think that skill bias technical change is particularly relevant there or personal services, uh, you know, like barbers have been cutting hair in the same way for like the last, you know, <laughs> 200 years at least. Uh, but uh, for other services, I would agree with you. Um, so I think there's a, uh, but, but in terms of like the approach, we can use the same, we can use the same approach. With respect to the COVID recession, um, yeah, I mean, there I think, um, you know, the the uh, the recession is as obviously a very unequal impact across occupations, um, and and there the key, uh, I think, the key uh, uh, determinant is whether the occupation is flexible or rigid, whether you can work from home or not. Um, so uh, we are. I mean, we're getting all the action here in the model from the bottom of the skill distribution and from other work that I've done uh, for, for another paper, uh, there's a very strong correlation between uh, the level of wages, level of education and the uh, rigid occupations. Uh, so I think in the sense we are capturing, uh, mm -hmm. capturing this dimension, although very indirectly because we're not looking directly at occupations or sectors. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, I'll just wrap up here. Thank you very much. Um, that was 
a very in, engaged talk. So let me just remind the audience also that we have another uh, VMAX talk, same time, uh, Thursday with Adrienne Auclair. And hope to see you there. Thanks again for coming. Thanks a lot to everybody for having us. Thank you. Thank you Thanks so much. Thank you, guys. Thanks for the invitation. Bye. Thanks a lot. It was great. Thanks, Martin. Bye. Thanks, guys. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.